Hang in there. Thank you, brother. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord again today. There's really no greater place that we could be. We've been looking at the big series that we're looking at and studying is on the church this time. And when we look at the church, it's not like anything else in this world. But rather, the church is God's bride. It's the bride that Christ is going to call up home one day. And when we look at the church, we're, we see that God's not looking for just any church, but he's looking for a sold-out church, a church that is called out of this world. We've looked in the first lesson where God always looked for a people that were called out from the world. They were not part of the world, but they were separate. They were keeping themselves special for God, clean, holy, pure. And when we look at the church, it's not like any other organization in this world. It's not a building, but rather it's a people. And it's not just a group of people coming together to learn about God while that's part of it. But the church is completely different. You have the Mormons, you have the Jehovah Witnesses, you have the Catholics, and they all meet. But the church is not just another organization. It is a living organism. It is growing. And when we look at the church, we start looking at its foundation with who is the chief cornerstone? Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. The stone that lays the direction for all the other stones in the building to go. It is the one that says this stone, oh, this wall is supposed to go this direction, this wall is supposed to go at this angle in that direction. And then who builds up, who forms the rest of the foundation of the church? The apostles and the prophets. And even when Christ is referring to the church when it comes to the apostles and the prophets. And let me just back up with that thought a second. And who adds to the foundation on top of the apostles and the prophets? We do. And what kind of stones does the Bible refer to us as when it comes to the church? We're not stagnant stones. What's that? Stepping stones. Not stepping stones. We're not dead stones, but we're lively stones. In the fact that it comes back to the idea that the church is a living organism. And I shouldn't say just idea, but it is fact that the church is a living organism. It's supposed to be constantly growing. It's supposed to be constantly expanding. And we do that through the power of the Holy Ghost. But when we look at an organization, it's dependent upon its people to build, build, build. But we have the Holy Ghost working through us, helping us, aiding us. And that's what makes us alive. The Bible says that the Word of God is quick and powerful. It is alive. Why is that? Because the author, the Holy Ghost, he is quick. He is powerful. For anyone who has experienced baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence in other tongues, whether you felt the Holy Ghost get inside you, did he just go stack it? No. You could tell that he's alive. There are certain times when I'm just going through life that all of a sudden I... It feels like the Holy Ghost, brother Eli, is starting to swirl in my body, in my stomach. And I can feel them there. There are other times when maybe I'm going to pray for people, or even I'm just praying in general, or even just talking to God. And I, it feels like the Holy Ghost is almost coming out of my fingertips. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is alive. And because of that, we are lying to stones when it comes to the church. We talked about the birth of the church, how it doesn't really matter, but we know where the church is. And the sense that people argue, was it here, was it there, not yet. It doesn't really matter. What we do know is this, that Jesus Christ began organizing and forming the church with the 12 disciples. He started training them. And then at the day of Pentecost is when it all changed. Now, as we start looking at, and let me just move on. I know I'm reviewing real quick. But the purpose of the church, and this is extremely important because we can go to a lot of churches in America. And they don't know the purpose of the church. And when I say don't know, even if they don't, they don't practice it. Because really, the purpose of the church is evangelism, education, and edification. And a lot of people come and they get edified. And maybe there's still churches that have Sunday school like ours, or maybe they have midweek teaching. So they get education, but nobody wants to evangelize. It's us for it and no more. We come, we sit in our pew, and we go home. Or we... We worship a God that takes attendance. I was there last Sunday. God took note of it. 
Because we all know that right next to the big book of life, God has the attendance book. It doesn't matter if you are faithful to him or not, but he has marked down when everybody was there. And of course, I'm not. But people have all kinds of misconceptions concerning the church. But we're going to move on today, talking, and just moving in today, we talked last week about the early church and how we moved beyond the early church because the early church was a baby church. None of us wanted to go back to the days where we drank from a bottle or when we had to be shown how to do this or shown how to do that. I mean, there's plenty of us, if we had to sit and think, man, I wish it'd be nice to be 21 again or 18 or something like that or be able to do what I did that back then, but if we had to sit down and think about it, would we really want to lose the knowledge that we've gained through experience and through life this far to go back to be that ignorant and do all those stupid things over again? We may wish to have the body of such, but do we really want to go back to that point in time? Can we glean good things from the early church? Absolutely. But I don't want to go completely back there. Now, today we're moving more to God's gifts to the church. And when we're looking at God's gifts to the church, let's go ahead, if you have your notes, does someone want to read Psalm 68 and verse 18? Psalm 68 and 18. So he led captivity captive. Hopefully already in our minds we're having flashbacks to, I didn't know that was in the Old Testament. I thought that was in the New Testament where Jesus said that he led captivity captive and he uh, made, uh, he spoiled the principalities and the powers of the air. I don't have that verse in our notes. But we see a, con a comparison and a correlation between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Except for in this verse, it says that he led captivity captive uh, referring to his triumph over the enemy at Calvary, but that he has given gifts to men. And Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, would someone like to read that? I'll go ahead and read it. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And then moving into 1 Corinthians 12, 28, which we'll talk about here in the next coming weeks, uh, sporadically as we talk about the different gifts individually. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So if we go back, and I'm going to move a little bit forward fast, and some slow, so just bear with me. But if we go back to John 16 and verse 7, we know that there is a time that as Christ is traveling with his disciples, as they're there with his ministry, he knew that there was going to be something that happened in the future. And the same thing is going to happen to all of us at some point in one fashion. Unless Christ goes back, we're not going to be here anymore. Not on this earth. Body might be, but will be deceased in Christ's terrors. Christ knew way back in John chapter 16 and verse 7 that even though he was going to die around us again, he wasn't always going to be physically with his disciples after his death 100% of the time. Not like they were there with him during the ministry. Because they were there traveling with them, he taught them, he tried to educate them, he told them things plainly out and they didn't understand them. But the key is, he was with them. But there was coming a point in time when Christ would no longer be with his disciples. They were going to be on their own. And they would have to face this world, not necessarily by themselves, but they would have Christ there with them to guide them and do things for them. Christ would not leave his followers defenseless. Defenseless. We know that he conquered the enemy. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we have that famous prophecy already given about the birth of the Messiah, the very first uh, prophecy given in the Bible, how the man born or born of woman will crush the serpent of it with his heel. And then we go on to Colossians 2.15. If I'm not mistaken, someone go ahead and read that, Colossians 2.15. So 
So he triumphed, triumphed over them, and he spoiled principalities. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, I'll read that. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors who teach. Ephesians 4, 8, that's why. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And there we see the counterpart to Psalms chapter 68 and verse 18. So Christ conquered the enemy, but he wasn't always going to be here. Yes, he was going to send the power of the Holy Ghost, but he would not be here to be the head of the church. When Christ was here on the earth, he was here in the physical. But now in the physical, where is Christ right now in the physical? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. So Christ is not physically down here. He's not the head of the church physically down here. He's not the one behind the pulpit every week in physical form. But rather, he's ascended on high. And he's given us the power of the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost is not a physical entity in the sense that you and I are. Yes, he's physical. We can feel him, see him. But not in the sense that I can see you and you can see me. So when Christ ascended on high in Acts chapter 1, we see the apostles standing there staring at the sky. So if Christ is the good shepherd, where does the church begin? What for leadership does it have? Does it have all the offices that we know of right now? When Christ ascended on high, were there deacons or bishops or council members, as we call them? No, there wasn't. Were there prophets? Were there prophetess? Not at this point in time yet. When Christ ascended on high, there's only one group of men that was left back here. And they are what we call as the apostles. Which if we jump back to uh, 1 Corinthians, and God set some of the church first apostles. Which if, and if you rack your brain a little bit, hopefully you remember last week we talked about the formation of the office of the deacon. Which we'll talk about after we talk about the, the section on the, uh, the gifts that Christ gave to the church. But first he gave apostles. And just going down through our list. Apostle. What is an apostle? He is an ambassador of the gospel. Officially a commissioner of Christ. Then he gave prophets. According to Strong Street Dictionary, prophets are a foreteller or an inspired speaker. Then he gave evangelists. Which evangelists, when we look at it defined, according to Strong Street Dictionary, with the Greek words used, it means a preacher of the gospel. And then we get to pastors and teachers. It's important to note that this is one office, pastors and teachers. There is no separation by a colon or a semicolon. It just goes pastors and teachers. It is one office. And according to that, it comes to from the Greek word didaskos, and it means an instructor. So with the last 15 to 20 minutes left, what is the purpose of the gifts of the church? And if we go back to the gifts of the church, and I'll already read it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, where the Bible states, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of their ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So it's for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministries, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is the point of these gifts. That is the purpose. See, when it comes to these gifts, it's not men do, performing these actions. When it comes to the apostles, when it comes to the prophets, when it comes to evangelists, pastors, really, we should not be trying to do something in our own flesh. We shouldn't. That's where the Holy Ghost comes in. There was a point in time when he was with men, but he dwelt in men. And even when the Holy Ghost worked in the Old Testament, it may not have been a permanent residence, 
but he still dwelled in men to fulfill the purpose of that point in time. What am I referring to? Well, if we go back to when Moses was overburdened with work, he was instructed to take 70 men to help him with the work. And what happened to those 70 men when the Holy Ghost came upon them? They prophesied. Do they prophesy out of their own flesh? Was the prophecy because they got excited because the Holy Ghost was on them? No. The prophecy came because the Holy Ghost was working through them. He was in them. It may not have been any permanent indwelling like we see that God was giving in Acts chapter 2, but the Holy Ghost still dwelled within men to perform the function of the work that he needed. Even when we go back to, as we mentioned last week, with Aholia and uh, Bezalel, they were given all knowledge and cunning work in metal and gold and silver, how to do this and how to do that. Did that come out of their natural? No, they didn't know how to do all those things. But the Bible says that the Spirit gave them instruction. And where did the Spirit come from? It wasn't just the Holy Ghost working from the outside, but He was working from within, outward. So when we come to the gifts of God, they are not meant for men to work from the outward to other people. We call that being charismatic, and it only goes so far. People can only be charismatic for so long and try to draw people in before they get tired or are them out because they're doing it through their own flesh. And these men can really be likened to the Old Testament uh, Israel. Why could they never fulfill the law? Because they were trying to do something that was spiritual through the flesh. And it never was going to happen. It couldn't be done. So the, the Holy Ghost was with men, but now he is in men. We find that in June, uh, June. John chapter 14 and verse 17, where the Holy Ghost is with you, but he shall be in you. So let's talk about a little bit of the prophetic you know, of the saints. When we talk about, in the Word of God, how these men, these apostles, these offices, were given for the perfecting of the saints, what do you think the Scriptures mean by perfecting of the saints? What do you think of when it comes to the perfecting of the saints? The Holy Ghost dwells within him. The Holy Ghost dwells within him. But it's a little bit more than that. The Holy Ghost, we know he can't dwell in an unclean vessel, but when we first get saved, were we, and I don't want to throw anybody off and say we weren't completely perfect, but were there areas of life that we had to work on? Were there things that we had to get rid of? Were there things we had to change? Did all those things come out of our own knowledge? Did sometimes we get correction without reading that section of the Word of God or even knowing that part of the Bible yet? Sometimes it does happen. And what is that? That is the Holy Ghost working on us from the inside out, correcting us, perfecting us, creating us to be in the very image of God. How else might we get perfected through these offices? It says they're for the perfecting of the saints. How about studying the Word of God? What does Acts chapter 6 and verse 2 say? Acts 2, 6. And the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. It is not reason that we should uh, leave the Word of God and serve tables. So when we look at the apostles in chapter 6, we are seeing the formation of the office of the deacon. And we, if we go back up to verse 1, we would find people murmuring that our widows aren't being taken care of, that the apostles aren't doing this, they are not getting there. My mom's been sitting in the same bed for six weeks, and, they, and John still hasn't gone there to visit her. But the apostle said that that's busy work. That's footwork. Why should we leave the word of God? To wait on tables. So when we look at this, how do the saints get perfected? Through the study of the Word of God. 
It's not just the Holy Ghost being inside us, correcting us, but it is us reading the Word of God. It is the preacher preaching. It is the Sunday school teacher or the pastor teaching or someone else teaching. As long as we're teaching the Word of God and we are allowing the Holy Ghost to deal with us, we're being perfected because, once again, those areas that are dark and maybe hidden from our eyesight are being revealed to us and brought into the light. Because the Holy Ghost shines on those areas because, in reality, do you know your own heart? Do you know how wicked your heart is? Do you know some areas? Do you know every area that needs to be dealt with at all times? No. But who brings that to light? The Holy Ghost. Because our hearts are deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? But through studying the Word of God, sometimes things pop out. Oh, I didn't know that. Or, you know what? I'm dealing with that. I didn't realize that was part of my life that I struggled with. I didn't realize it until just now. Well, what happens then? It is through the study of the Word of God that things come to light, that the Holy Ghost reveals things, that we say, all right, I need to go to the altar and get it right. And what happens when we go to the altar sincerely and take care, take care of the issue? The saints are being perfected. You're, as a saint of God, is slowly being perfected. We are cha being changed from glory into glory. It's not an instantaneous progress, but we are instantaneously um, saved, instantaneously um, sanctified, but there's also the progressive aspect of it where we are constantly working and constantly allowing the Holy Ghost to change us, <coughs> allowing Him to constantly perfect us. And by doing so, this is bringing us in right order with God. Because to whom much is given, much is required. And if you know it needs to be changed, then you need to get it right. The pastor, the minister, it is their responsibility to bring forth the truth of the word. And by doing that, they are trying to perfect the saints, which is part of the purpose of these gifts. But it's also left down to the saint themselves to make sure that they are allowing the Holy Ghost to perfect them. Because, once again, we come back to that whole, we are to be changed from glory to glory, from one stone to another, slowly into the image of Jesus Christ. And then it is to, it is for the work of the ministry. If we would have backed up into verse 1, we don't have to, but in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, like I said, we see the creation of the office of the deacon because there was murmuring, murmuring around them that the widows are being neglected. <coughs> so the work of the ministry is also for the edifying of widows, for the ed, uh, ministering to the widows. And we see that in today's society as the work of the pastor because along with the pastor, he is the shepherd of the sheepfold. But what else? Do we expect him to do? If great grandmother's in the hospital sick, we expect the pastor to do his best to try to get there and visit her. If we have somebody that is shut in and can't get out of church, if we consider them this part of that part of this church, what do we expect the pastor to do? Now I realize we're in a little bit of a different situation. The pastor can't get to everybody with a full time job. Well, it's the reality of the thing. You can't be everywhere at one time and you can't do everything. But in a perfect world, with somebody who is pastoring full-time, we would expect them to go to the hospital when somebody's there. We would expect them to go to the shut-ins, to minister to them because they can't get out from church. Just different aspects of it. And really, that's what we see in Acts chapter 6. Them expecting the minister to go out to minister to the widows, to the shut-ins, to those that can't get out. There are other aspects to the work of the ministry as well because... We, along with that, we could fall back into, we expect the minister to study the Word of God, to be knowledgeable with it, because we don't want to just follow anybody anywhere. If you've ever, I don't know if you've seen the old penny of the blind leading the blind, there's four men with their hands on their shoulder, and the uh, guy in front is going into a ditch. Well, because he's going into the ditch, everybody else is going to end up in the ditch. No. We can only go as far as our leader takes us. And if our leader is shallow, if he's not knowledgeable when it comes to the thing of God, if he's not sensitive to the moving of God, all these things impact us. That is part of the work of his ministry. Not that when it comes to trying the spirits, and that, not that that's not part of ours too, because the Bible says to try the spirits. But the, 
gifts when it comes is we would expect the minister to help teach us how to try those spirits. Because not every spirit needs to be spiritually discerned. There are those times, but there are things that as we grow in God, that we should be able to look at it. You know what? That's not a God. Just here in the last couple of months, I had somebody talk to me. He goes, I don't know why God's allowing me to go through, get, why God gives me all this anxiety. Why he allows this to come upon me, or why he allows, why he's letting me go through this. And in our mind's eye, we should be able to tell you know what? That's not God that's bringing the anxiety on to you. Why can we do that? Was that spiritually deserved? Not necessarily. I mean, maybe uh, ingrained within our spirit, and it's coming forth out. But we should know enough of the Bible to say that, well, God is not the spirit, author of fear, but of power and love and of, of a sound mind. You know, I don't need to be spiritually all the time to be able to decipher that in that situation. If you're facing anxiety, well, that's not God. God may be allowing you to go through because he wants you to realize his, your dependency upon him, but he's not the one that br is bringing it on you all the time. That's the other guy that's going about causing problems. But then there are times when things might be going on in church where I've even heard a minister, go, oh, she was sitting in church one time and there was a tongues and interpretation or a prophecy given where she goes, she, I was sitting back and she goes, God, that sounds like you, but that's not you. There are other times when it's spiritually discerned. But it is the purpose work of the minister to help bring this into that understanding. Because someone who's new in Christ isn't necessarily going to have that. Then we have for the edifying of the body of Christ. And this kind of, kind of all these, to some degree, can kind of go back and forth. But the edifying of the body of Christ, guiding them in their walk with God. Being able to realize, you know what, brother, God's not giving you that anxiety. That's not coming from him. Helping them to realize that, hey, there's another voice out there, and it's not God that's guiding you to be wrong. Or there's other times that, you know what, that's not God, and that's not necessarily him. The devil gets blamed for a whole lot. That's just your mind running all over the place, and that's your voice. You know, it's guiding people into that place so they can walk with God and grow. Because it's not always a matter of growing in leaps and bounds, but once we get a clear, solid foundation, then we can grow. But not everyone's in the same place. Not everybody's in the same relationship with God or at the same place in the relationship. And it may take time. But you know, there are things that I've learned from listening to preaching on CD that I've not learned in my own Bible study. That's helped me to grow. And it's just a matter of that constant building. And the building of their faith, as, as mentioned in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans 10, 17. If you beat me to it, go ahead and read it. So faith cometh by hearing hear by the word of God. So faith cometh by what? Hearing. And where does the hearing come by? From the Word of God. So it's a building of our faith. So it's coming to church. It's listening to the preacher preach. It's listening to the minister teach. All these things help build our faith because faith cometh by hearing. And if they're preaching or teaching from the Word of God, hearing comes by the Word of God. Then we look at evangelism. We all know the Great Commission. We talked about it the other week. Um, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do we not expect that from our ministers? Do we not expect them to go out as well, inviting people to church? Now, that's not giving us a license to slack off or anything, because we are all commanded. But do we not expect our ministers to go out and tell people about Christ? Do we not expect our ministers to knock on doors? One thing that I read about Brother Clay's, and I think it was in the 10-year pamphlet, anniversary pamphlet, was that there's probably... Not a door in this whole Likens Valley that Brother Place had not knocked on. Whether to invite to church or whatever it was. Can we say the same thing is true in our own lives, in the lives of our ministers? Are they going out and telling people about Christ? Because it is a matter of restoring individuals to Christ. I can't force them to do that. You can't force them to them. But the Holy Ghost can work on people, making them realize their need. 
And what we look at is a restore. When they accept salvation, it is a restoring of the individual. The word perfecting, if we go back to the first uh, point there, in the perfecting of the saints working in the ministry, the word perfecting literally means a restoring again or bringing into newness or completion again. Is that not what salvation is? We were once dead in sin, but it's taking that sinner and bringing him into the family of God, giving them new life in Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost. And then it's from there, it's a matter of the ministers bringing those individuals, and not just bringing them, but bringing you and I into holiness with God. The Bible says that without holiness, no man can see God. When we look, refer to the place of God's throne in heaven, we refer to it as God's holy hill. At least I do. I guess that's not in Psalm 24, but who shall ascend into the hill alone? But God is holy, and therefore we must be holy. And I can go back to an Old Testament prophet who saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train fill the temple. We can go back to Isaiah. And before that point, do you remember what Isaiah was doing? He was yelling at the people, best, basically. He was giving the word of the Lord, but basically he was criticizing and yelling at the people. And telling them that they need to get right. Or in other terms, they need to get holy with God. They need to get holy. They need to repent. They need to get right. But in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw God, there is a shift. For six chapters, he cries, woe unto the people. But when he sees God, he says, woe is me. Why? Because as good as Isaiah was, he was the prophet of God. He was the man of God. He was the minister of God. He was doing his job. But when he saw Jesus Christ, he realized that, you know what? My heart is deceitfully wicked, and there was something that was hidden from me. And God, I am a man of unclean lips. And I am no better than those people that I was crying woe to. And that I'm no better than those people that I was telling him to get right, you know, what God, I thought I was right with you, but I see an area that needs to be worked on. That is the work of the minister. To bring people into holiness, and at the same time, while they are doing that. Because it is all a matter of perfecting the saints, educating the saints, doing the work of the ministry, and edifying the body of Jesus Christ. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us, and Lord, do. Now, Lord, we praise you because you're God who reigns on high, and there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, having his way, if he so chooses, in whatever way, Lord, may we not limit him, but Lord, may we just allow him to move, that we may be draw closer to you and be changed into your very image, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you know the song leader and the musicians, as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords, that you give them a special blessing as well. And only the song leader and the musicians, that is, they give you praise and glory. And only the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word. May your words flow forth. And may our hearts and our minds be in one mindset and one accord, Lord. That we may not only just worship you in sincerity and truth, but let, that our hearts and our minds be plowed that they be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it may take root in our heart, Lord. And may we constantly be sensitive to your spirit, that we may grow, that we may be changed, allowing you to change us from glory to glory, knowing that, Lord, if you took Elisha, Elijah up in a whirlwind and changed him and gave his mortal body, gave him his immortal body, if you took Enoch up and translated him, how much more could we get so close with you in our walk that one day you just say, why don't you come up and follow and translate us and give us our incorruptible body then and there, Lord. 
that we may know you in the power of your resurrection. We pray, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.